choir. Thank you, Q. It's a familiar story that I wanted us to relate to in a little bit different way. Because this is a story that shows us the risk that we have taken once we cross the poison river with our call and leave the internal sta stages of our reflection and our discernment and move into the public arena. So just as we many times resist God's call in our life or the call to make a change, to step in a new direction, um, whatever that call might look like, it means there's something that has to shift, that has to be different, and, and that is normally greeted with resistance. And then we move into a way to reclaim how this is a, an outgrowth of roots that have already been there from our personal lives, from the lives of our families and ancestors and communities. It is a part of the ongoing story. And we have this beautiful moment of revelation of God giving us a glimpse of that Kairos time um, in, in uh, separately from our daily routine and the chronos that just keeps churning and going, but enough of that glimpse to capture our heart and to give us the courage to know that this call is real, is of God, and to cross that river into the public arena. And there's real risk because we have changed. So will others change with us? Will they accept that change? Will they reject that change? Will we be um, accepted and have a community? Will we be isolated and alone? And here in this story is the unfolding of all of that, right? We have the younger son, and we wouldn't call it a call. From the outside looking in, we would say it was more of a selfish thing, right? To say, Dad, you're dead to me. Give me your money. Peace out. Um, but... If we look at it from his thing, maybe from his perspective, maybe it was a call and needing to break away and go away and establish life on his own. And then he does that and all of a sudden everything falls apart and he is able to reclaim in that pig pen what his father's household was like and know that because of his actions, things won't ever be able to be exactly the same but there could be a different kind of relating. That takes a lot of risk. And, and so as he crosses that river and he has his speech rehearsed and he comes and ready to say, Father, I have sinned before you and before heaven, that risk melts away in the arms of a father who runs to greet him, to embrace him, and to celebrate that he is home. And so that family tie that this younger son was able to reclaim, he's able to hold in completion in his father's greeting. He's also not able to hold or reconcile in this passage that we know of with his brother. And so there is risk that is both resolved in a beautiful way and there is risk that is left unresolved. And that is very much what happens when we cross the river and when we have changed because it means then that we invite our family, our friends, and our community to change with us or to also reject that change. So that means in this stage of relating, we are finding a community that shares our call and that is a part of that call and working that call together. And that means that there might be those who hear the call as we have heard, and there is that community formed, and that also might mean that that call is not heard and that this becomes a stage of saying thank you, of blessing one another um, for coming to this point and then letting each other go to follow different calls. So there's a lot of excitement and beauty unfolding as we find the new things that God has for us as we read in the passage from Paul. And there's a lot of grieving of the old things that were so critical and formational for us, but that can't go with us in this next stage. Paul is a beautiful example of this as well, and we will be spending our Easter season following Paul um, because there's not really anyone who has such a dramatic crossing of the river than of Paul, of Saul to Paul, of persecuting the Jews um, to becoming the champion. Um, of uh, the Christians to becoming the champion of the followers of Christ. And so 
um, there is tremendous risk in what Paul gives up that we were reading in that Philippians passage before um, of citizenship, of rights, of privileges that he gives up to claim the new creation he has been made in Christ. And we also need to give props to Ananias in this moment because that is the priest that we often forget um, from Damascus who followed God's call to go to the person who's been killing his brothers and sisters and followers of Christ to heal him um, and to give him additional power back. Um, so talk about a risk. Um, I, that, I have no idea. I have no idea how Ananias had spiritual fruit and connection with God deep enough to cross that river and manage that risk. Um, um, to trust God to make this new beginning in Paul possible. Um, and so it very much is a community. It very much is relationships that make this possible. And this is the moment we remember that relationships are calls to. It's not about just what we do for a vocation, whether that's in ministry um, or in any other way of work. It's also about who our friends are and who our family is and who we collaborate with and join together with. Um, and so relationships are call as well. If you will indulge me, um, one of the best examples in modern um, culture of the relating phase that goes well, like the father of scripture, is the movie Moana that we did this summer, right? Um, so her grandmother points her to digging out those ships, right? And then we have Lynn manuel Miranda's voice coming as the you know, flames burst up and the song happens and a portion of history that had been buried of who she was is reclaimed. And it's something that she's able to reclaim. It's definitely not something anyone else is able or ready to reclaim at that moment. But she takes it and she literally crosses river and barrier reef and, and so forth and takes on that risk for her community because of how strong her call is. And then the risk happens and failure happens and she questions that call again and again there's relationships, again there's a grandmother, again there's a song that reminds her of that call. And she's able to keep going and comes home <laughs> and the entire tribe adopt what she reclaims. And so we've got that final scene of them all together out as voyagers on the ships, going beyond the reef, crossing the river all together, and the delight and the fun, kind of what we were trying with, with the kids with a trust fall, something that can be terrifying, or think of the giant swing at, at West River Camp, something that can just be terrifying and then turn into a sheer wave of glee and happiness and excitement excitement. And that's the beautiful part, when that dissonance of risk is resolved into a glorious new sound that bursts out across creation, that brings complete new life, that brings reconciliation, not only of who we are individually, internally, but who we are together as a community and an entire group of people claim their purpose and go together. In church settings, one of my um, colleagues, a part of the clergy group um, that we've been doing continuing education together for almost the last 10 years, um, is at a Baptist church in Virginia where there are a couple of families um, with children of different abilities. And that has completely changed the call of this congregation to the point where they have set up worship specifically geared um, for people of different abilities to be able to interact and claim the sacred in a way that traditional worship structure um, isn't set up to do. It means that my friend went and got her doctorate of ministry in terms of understanding a believer's baptism in light of differing abilities. And so this is a journey that the entire community has related to and claimed as their own call because of the couple of families that came with their particular call. So this is what can happen in, in a community setting, in a church setting, when there is a need and when that need becomes that place where um, there is the deep joy and gladness of not just one person but an entire community, right? Where our deep joy and gladness meet the world's deep need. There are also times when that doesn't happen, when that resolution of the dissonance doesn't resolve. 
and when it means that a new community is needed. And these are some of the hardest points of how we relate to each other because we love each other and we don't want to lose anyone. We don't want our friends to go. We don't want the community to be broken or changed. And this can be a time that is ruled by fear or it can be a time that is ruled by blessing and faith. Because the thing is, people will leave. People will leave communities because that is the flow of life and the way that it goes. And we can either take that as a concern of what's wrong with me or how dare you introduce even more change into our lives to deal with, um, and that can be a time of anger and frustration and getting stuck there. Or it can be a time of being able to be grateful for the fact of the matter that people are where they are because of this community, because of the time that has been shared together, because of what has been learned, and because of the ability to follow a call. That, that ability to step out and to clearly know what you are called to do and who you are called to be is because of the time spent. And so it's ascending. Leaving doesn't necessarily need to be a leaving. It can be seen as ascending. It can be seen as a blessing of we have gathered in here, we have supported, we have grown one another. There are calls that have been heard and no, they are not our calls, but we know how they are others' calls, and we can celebrate that person being brave enough and being supported by the community enough to go out and to find the community that also has that call. Because here's the thing, Jesus hasn't returned yet, and so there is so much work that is needed to be done, right? If, if our call is where our deep joy and gladness and the world's deep hunger meet, we know how much hunger there is. We know how many people are hungry. We know how many places and systems and communities and moments of hunger there are. And so for a call that is sent to meet one of those places is a beautiful thing to celebrate, to bless, and to send, even if it means saying that's not our place of hunger that we are called to address, because that's not where our deep joy also lives. But we know where, what our deep joy is, and we know what hunger we are addressing. And so that gives us a chance to celebrate the call and the work that God is doing through each of us, even if that means different relating and different communities and different chapters. And so what this call language does, I hope, is give us a language of blessing, of give us a language of celebrating the work of the Spirit as it moves through us. And we're always gonna be a twinge of terrified of that movement because it is always beyond us. It is always gonna involve risk and there's not gonna be any getting around that. But we can decide whether that fear is a twinge that lives on the edge of excitement and fulfilling our full selves and stepping into this call or if it's a fear that takes everything over and disables us not only from blessing someone in their call, but in following our own call as well. We are made in the image of God, and the image of God is one of relationship, of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And there will be time just as Paul models and just as Christ models, where Christ is with us, and then there will be time when Christ ascends from us and we have to say goodbye and to release, to welcome in the new thing that Christ will be doing. When Christ sends the Holy Spirit so that what was available in Christ for one particular people at one particular time in one particular area is now available for all people in all times and all places. This movement, this call, this cycle, this relating and releasing is a part of the divine image in which we are made. It is not a comfortable one, but it is a beautiful one. 
And this is a time where we will be called to live into figuring that relating out as we go through our own transitions in the global United Methodist Church and what will happen, and in our local church here in multiple transitions of leadership, and then in our own individual lives and calls that have happened, and, and whether that be dating relationships, whether that be jobs, whether that um, be illnesses that change the way things are, this movement will always be present. And so it is what I believe our call to open our hearts and souls and minds that we might be able to do this movement with the Spirit, knowing and trusting God that there will be power given to us just as there was to Ananias, just as there was to Paul to make drastic changes that are needed but that are given to us piece by piece by step by step so that we are able to in the fullness of God. This is not something that we can do alone. And so we gather at the communion table to remember that God does this with us, that God prepares the way for us and will lead us every step of the way and will bring us into that new creation, into that new calling, into that new chapter. There's lots of hunger out there. And so as we come to this communion table, I would like us to come reflecting on this piece of call. Relationships are calls in and of themselves. They will either limit our ability to live into our own call, or they will empower and expand our ability to live into our own call, which means who we relate to, who we spend time with, who we spend more time with, who we spend less time with, who we spend time with in just in a different way, in different capacity, is a part of that call. And so I'd like for us to have that be our discipleship reflection in the coming week of what relationships we need to lean into more that are empowering our expansion of our call, of what relationships we need to bless and let go of because they are limiting our ability to step into our call and what are simply we need to, to give a change of address to and, and to start to build in a different way um, as a part of our call. Because the thing is, there is hunger everywhere. And what we need to do is find where our deep gladness will meet that hunger and where the Holy Spirit can work in her fullness. Would you stand in body or in spirit to join in singing that prayer, all who hunger, as we come to the communion table?